There was this moment as I was descending the crack where I had three points of contact on it. I had my hands and my feet. And as I was descending to put my fourth foot down, I slipped and I got to look underneath me. And I saw that there was nothing under my feet. In other words, if you fall down, that's it. Hello friends, old and new. My name is Mustafa and this is MK Fingerstyle Academy. In case you're new, this channel is all about fingerstyle tabs and tutorials. But in today's ukulele session episode, I wanna talk about one experience that changed my life forever as a person and subsequently as a music performer. And that transformation seems to be me not having, or more precisely, not caring about performance anxiety. Wouldn't it be cool if we all just not have it anymore? Well, it's not that simple. I don't have the solutions, but I do have a story that might make you think of one. Let's dive in. For a little bit of context and background story, I love scrambling in the Canadian Rockies. Which is counterintuitive for somebody who relies on nails to play their instrument. I started scrambling around the beginning of my bachelor's degree for classical guitar. At that time, I bought the iconic Alan Kane's Scrambling in the Canadian Rockies Guide, and I did quite a few scrambles from that book. And one thing that I like to do on my free time as I prepare for my next scrambles is browse through the book and pick my next objectives. One of those objectives was this interesting mountain called Mount Stephen. So, as I used to do with all my other mountains, I YouTubed it to see what it looks like. And this is what I saw. As you can see, it has this insane ridge walk at the end with nothing on the sides but a sheer 1,900 meter drop. And right before it, you're isolated on the summit block with exposed scrambling. And to make things worse, just before that, there is a steep 1,750 meter hike to get to that summit block. In other words, you need strength, stamina, bravery, and skill to do this mountain. Which for me at that time, the summit was way above my head, but I was obsessed with getting on top. I decided Mount Stephen would be my objective, and two years later, I was standing at the summit. The summer in which I got to the top was right after I finished my senior recital for my bachelor's degree. I spent the whole summer watching that video because there were no other videos available at the time. And what I did by watching the video is watch every single frame, look at the surroundings and make a mark of them and make a mark of what they look like and what steps and moves I have to do in order to overcome those obstacles. And I cross-referenced those frames and images from the video with the photos that were available to me from blogs, from scrambles who have done the mountain. Basically, I came up with a visual image of what I have to do in order to get over that summit block. So we got to the summit and I have to say I was a little bit disappointed. That day was probably one of the best, most beautiful days that I've ever had on the mountains. Clear skies, sunny and perfect temperature with no snow on the mountains. In other words, ideal conditions for scrambling a mountain of that difficulty, which looked nothing like the video that I was watching and idolizing. But at least I had a clear view on the summit block and I had the chance to see exactly what I had to do in order to get over the obstacles. One of those obstacles and arguably the most difficult is this crack that you have to go up to, which is really thin and you're hanging on with your hands and feet almost like a chameleon as you go up this crack. This crack is very exposed, which means if you fall down, you're falling down a long distance and has this airy feeling to it as you're hanging on for dear life. You get on this crack by traversing around a really thin ledge as you hug the face of the mountain and your toes are gripping on that ledge. And then you get to the crack and you start going up and you can only do it one person at a time because the ledge is so thin. Now, once you get to the summit ridge, it is really thin, but it's not as scary looking as the original video made it look like. Yes, you have to hop and yes, there is a sheer drop, but there is a little bit more space on it than the image would make it look like. I think that had to do with the fisheye lens that was used on the original video. Whatever it is, I felt super confident and safe and I was hopping my way to the summit. On the way down though, things are very different. You see, on the way up, all you see is the mountain in front of you because you're going up on an incline and all you see is the gravel. Everything is localized to what your eyes can see. But on the way down, the angle is reversed and then you get to see the whole valley and the summit underneath you. And it really makes you appreciate where you are in terms of size and how small you are. It also makes you hyper aware of what will happen to you if things go wrong and you take a fall. And if you remember, on the way up, there was that thin crack. On the way down, 
you have to down climb it. There was this moment as I was descending the crack where I had three points of contact on it. I had my hands and my feet. And as I was descending to put my fourth foot down, I slipped and I got to look underneath me. And I saw that there was nothing under my feet. In other words, if you fall down, that's it. Normally, you would be scared to death. It looks scary. But one thing that happened to me that day was that I was so focused on my body and action that all my surroundings, no matter how scary or beautiful it was, stopped to exist or have an impact on my localized vision of what I was doing. After the crack, we were lost a little bit and we reached this wall, this vertical tall wall that we had to down climb without ropes. My two friends made it down and then they encouraged me to down climb it. I have down climbed walls before, but not that steep and not for that length at that exposure. It was my first time doing something like this at that level, especially if you factor in that our hike has started at three o'clock in the morning and we've been hiking for almost 12 hours at that point. I was exhausted, but still I was hyper focused to be able to safely down climb. And once you do that, you can hike all the way down to the car and you're done. Summit bagged, victory achieved. But something weird happened to me when I got to the car. I was transformed. I remember on the ride home, I was with my then girlfriend and I, my wife. She was driving and I was super quiet. And in fact, I was super quiet for the next two weeks before I slowly snapped out of it. I was so focused in that climb, in that stretch of hours, on the crack, on my hands, on my surroundings, and absorbing the beautiful views. I felt both the safest and the most dangerous slash thrill in my life. When you're so alone and isolated from the things that preoccupy your daily life, and you place your trust in other human beings who are next to you in the same location, going through the same experience, it changes the way you perceive danger and your self-perception or awareness of your weaknesses. But what does that have to do with music, finger style, or performance anxiety? Well, every time I picked up an instrument and performed after that moment, whether I got the performance jitters or not, whether I was ready or not, whether it was a friendly crowd or not, that moment of isolation was the same moment that I experienced on Mount Stephen, except a lot less dangerous. My life isn't going to be over if I played the wrong note. But that level of focus and hyper-awareness as your body operate in normal speed, but your brain sees everything in slow motion as you observe your surroundings, that helped me lose my performance anxiety. And to be clear, I'm not saying I stopped getting performance anxiety, no. In fact, my hands were still shaking in my first master's recital performance five or six years later. What I'm saying is that moment in my life have taught me how to appreciate and be excited about these moments, but it taught me how trivial these performance anxiety dangers are compared to other things that can happen and that I am the master of what happens next in every passing moment. But I think the most important lesson that I've learned from that day when I stood on top of Mount Stephen compared to all the summits that I've done before, is that I did it for me. And not to impress others in the age of social media attention seeking or prove my worth to other people. I did not do it to snap a photo to make other people jealous or to show them how happy I was. I did it entirely for me and for my own demons. And every time I walked on stage after that moment, I was not caring about the eyes looking at me or proving myself or proving my worth through the hours of practicing that I've done before that performance. I started doing something that my body and brain haven't done before on stage. Whenever I played a note, I listened.